All right, so we're live. All right. And everyone's just joining automatically, it looks like. <coughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, folks. Next. So are you a presenter too? Can you see everything I can? Like mm -mm. Um, I have the chat box available and the QA. Okay. Can you see the participants? Mm-hmm. All right. Hello everyone and welcome. We're gonna give probably give it a couple minutes and then get it rolling. How is it where you are right now, Sky? Is it uh, snow on the ground or nice? Oh no, it's beautiful. It's just kicking off spring. Like all the trees are in bud and um, it's probably like almost 70 out today. So this is always just the kind of the beginning of the spring. Does that really windy? Typical. Are you still expecting snow in Virginia this time or is that done? No, we're done. If we get snow, I'm down in Richmond, like Northern Virginia, it's, it's we're right on a, like a weather line. But we'll maybe get snow once, twice a year, if that we very rarely get. I mean, and if we do, if we do, obviously nobody knows how to deal with it. And so it's usually like a week off school for the kids. Oh, <laughs> Three inches of snow. Like, because then it, it gets cold. It does get cold, but it just doesn't snow. Yeah. Do they do a lot of indoor there where you are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of futsal, um, more than what we grew up in as indoor but there is an indoor facility a couple indoor facilities as well um but things like the the older are um like ecnl girls and boys train outside year-round they're able to to pull that off um but our younger kids we bring them inside for futsal okay hey you're a webinar expert like when i click on the participant thing it says invite should i be inviting them Nope. Everyone, there's 52 people, 53, I don't have my glasses on, that are here and listening to us okay. chat as we wait for more people to arrive. Yeah. And then um, I guess we could ask somebody to pop into the chat that they can hear us and see us fine. So then we're like, sure that we're not just talking to ourselves. <laughs> okay. There, somebody raised a hand. All right. There you go. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. <clears throat> see, now everybody's chiming in. Maybe one more minute and then we'll get it rolling. Okay. You, said you, yeah. you have some intro slides anyway, right? Or I do. Yeah. A speech, a rally cry, whatever it is. Perfect. Hi, Matt Bernard. He just sent me a funny text. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, NorCal guys. It's awesome to have so many people on the on the call. Um always such great education and curiosity that's happening with you all. So I'm really excited about this. Well, what do you think, Sky? Can we give it a roll? Do it. Awesome. Yep, okay. let's do it. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rick Fullerton. Uh, I am with NorCal Premier, the uh, coordinator of club services for the organization. And um, by way of an introduction, uh, we polled our membership, we polled the presidents and DOCs last fall and asked what topics would be of most interest for NorCal to provide some resources, some educational resources. And um, a lot of things came up, uh, managing COVID, handling the referee shortage, uh, promoting character development among kids. But the single, um, the single most important topic that uh, our membership uh, brought to us as being of interest to them was managing and helping create uh, a culture for parents and for parent behavior. And so um, we're very fortunate because today we have with us uh, Sky Eddy. Uh, Sky is the founder and director of the Soccer Parenting Association. Uh, the mission of the association is to inspire players by empowering parents. And she's done a ton of work, research, webinars, interviews, on this topic. Um, I'd say she's probably as close to an expert as we could find. So um, Sky, thank you so much for joining us and I'd love to just turn it over. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much. And like I was saying, thanks so much to um, NorCal Premier. I always um, have been inspired even as a young 20 year old working with the Zemers and really realizing that there's something special going on in that part of the country from a soccer standpoint. So it is truly a pleasure for me to be here today. 
Um, and um, thank you. Um, I do want to just start by saying if you have any questions or comments, um, we'll be monitoring. If it's specifically a question for me, then put it in the Q&A, but obviously help yourselves to the chat and chat away. But um, I personally will do my best to try to keep my eye on the, um, on the questions. I know Rick will do that as well. Um, I do have some slides that I'm going to share with you. I'm going to show you a couple of things. And um, despite the fact that this is a webinar, which feels a little bit one-sided, um, I do want it to be as interactional as possible. So please pop those questions um, if anything that I'm saying is triggering you with another thought or with some more curiosity. Um, I certainly, certainly welcome that. I would like to start with you all putting into the chat um, just so that I can kind of get a gauge um, here of if your role is as a leader within a club, meaning like a DOC, technical director, marketing director, whomever, um, you might be. So if your role is as a leader or is it as a coach only, and also how you would rate your club on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest from apparent engagement standards, practices that you have in place. Uh, did I say 10 being the highest? 10 being the highest, sorry, if I messed that whole thing up and one being the lowest. So um, I would like to know again, if you're a leader or a coach and just a quick rating of your club, one lowest, 10 highest, on how you rate your club when it comes to parent engagement practices, just so that I can get sort of a scale or an idea of where we're starting. And while those are coming in, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will go ahead and get started with my slides. Okay, Oop, let me just go ahead and two slideshows going on here. Sorry, I'm gonna actually stop sharing that and then I'm gonna go back and share this. Okay, all right. So um, Rick, we're good. You can see my slides, right? Yes, we are good. Okay, awesome. Um, excellent. Well, what I hope to accomplish today is to get a good sense of the why the how, the what, to give you a good sense of what parent engagement is. This is a term that we talk about a lot, gets kind of thrown around almost sort of as a common uh, bit of our vernacular, but I think it's really, really important that we, one, define it and talk about how we can implement these within our club structures, why it's important, and what we're actually talking about from a parent engagement standpoint. And then we'll dive into trust and collaboration. I wanna cover that quickly. You know, the very first time I ever presented for soccer parroting was at the convention in California, whenever it was last out in California, maybe even the year before when it was in Philly. But my topic was establishing trust in the coach parent relationship. So absolutely foundational to this work of parent engagement is this concept of trust. And there's a lot that we can learn about trust and why it's important within our ecosystem. We know that it's really lacking. Uh, from the top down, we just had our US soccer AGM uh, presidential um, voting last week at their AGM. So, you know, it brings back all these thoughts of the stress that exists, this lack of trust oftentimes. So we'll dive into that. I then want to share with you uh, the research about sense of community, which I'm very excited about. I know some of you have heard it before, if you've heard me present before, but it's uh, for you all that are club leaders, this, these are the steps that you need to take in order to establish stronger sense of community within your club. And then we'll dive into the sideline project and sideline behavior. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I am a, a former player. I um, grew up in the youth game, played with our youth national team programs, with a youth All-American, um, was also a... Um, a dual sport athlete. I competed in track as well. I went on to play collegiately. I was an All-American in college, played professionally um, in Tabernacle uh, for uh, Tabernacle Familiale in Udine in Italy. And, um, and I've always been a coach. Uh, even since high school, I was coaching. I'm a goalkeeper. I did student goalkeeper training. And then I was really, really lucky through college to have incredible mentors. I worked um, as Dr. Matnick's first female director 
with the number one camps and worked for Doc for about six years, then moved on with Doc's blessing to work for Tony and my quest for our national team uh, career and worked for Tony DeChico for 14 years as a director with Soccer Plus Camps. So really uh, fortunate to have some really strong mentors in the game. But again, I've always been a coach. I have my B license from US Soccer. I'm a coach educator in their grassroots programs that I also work with United Soccer Coaches doing their goalkeeping diplomas. So when I uh, became a soccer parent with all of my coaching background, coaching collegiately, coaching for years in the youth game, I thought this will be easy for me to be a soccer parent. And it actually really wasn't. I really, really struggled. In fact, last night, my daughter was stuck in Kansas. Um, she is 21 now. She's taking her D license and she got stuck in Kansas last night when the airport shut down in a snowstorm. And the last message she sent to me when she finally got settled in a hotel room and after lots of stress and canceled flights and rebooking booking flights, she said, mom, I sure hope my kids have your mentality, not mine. And I thought that was really funny. But it's a real story of why it was so hard to be a soccer parent with her because Callie and I are very, very different. And so while I thought being a soccer parent would be easy, it wasn't. And in large part, the work that I've done with soccer parenting has been this quest to support my kids um, within the game, knowing that my needs are also the needs of um, millions of parents across the country who have been left out of the soccer experience and really need to have um, some education and information about how they can best support their child. So that's where soccer parenting began. And it's really built into a lot of partnerships. Um, this is Callie when she's 12 years old. She had just made the ECNL team. Uh, we had the summer training. We're up at, the, at vacation. I like marked out in chalk where she needed to run to go through her little summer fitness and was so excited, got my watch out. She did one rotation through this fitness thing, sat down, and this is the picture that I took. She's crying. She's like, what are you doing? You're crazy. Why do you care so much? I feel so much pressure. I feel so much stress. And so I'm so glad I snapped a picture in that moment because this really sums up the path and journey that I've been on as a parent. Um, over the over the years in trying to support Callie. Thankfully, she's doing well now, loves the game so much, and we have figured it out, thanks in large part to many of the interviews and um, interactions that I've had with so many people over the years and the work that we're doing with soccer parenting. Um, I said this um, in a serious interview, a serious uh, a radio interview a while ago, and it got a lot of uh, play through Twitter. And I think it's actually really kind of sums up uh, the work that we're doing with soccer parenting in, in many ways. Um, and this should sum up and maybe give you a sense of, as a club leader and as a coach, like a sense of um, maybe shifting your thinking just a little bit about how we choose to interact with parents. But this is a statement that I said to parents, and I'm sure you've read it by now, but until we have some sincere and honest conversation about the way that we've treated our children, both good and bad, and how we've impacted them, you know, we'll really be missing an important part of the solution. And the key word here for me in this quote is solution. And I do want us to frame the roles of parents within our youth soccer landscape, within the work that we do on a daily basis, with the clubs, with the, co with the teams that we're working with, that parents are actually a solution. And um, I have a question for you, and it's framed around this idea from my good friend, Marco Sullivan from AIK who's doing some incredible work in building a club culture there. But, you know, we're all looking for answers, but what we really should be doing is asking better questions. So I want to start today with you all about one question, and it's something for you to just kind of ponder. You know, what do you believe to be true about you soccer parents? And until we can have some as coaches, some honest and sincere conversation about how we've treated parents, and the impact that we've uh, let them have, both good and bad, you know, we'll be missing an important part of the solution. So we could frame that uh, statement that I had for parents around coaches as well. And what um, I often hear from coaches, thankfully, this is really starting to change. This narrative is absolutely shifting. I mentioned that convention that I went to uh, the, in California, and so many times at that convention, people came up to me and told me this joke, 
my what what's my favorite team a team full of orphans uh so many coaches told me that that so many coaches offered to buy me drinks knowing that I was the soccer parenting person and willing to work with parents or deal with parents. And thankfully at this convention that we just had where I hung out with many of you fun North Cal people, nobody told me that joke. Uh, nobody offered to buy me a drink because of the work that I'm doing. Um, so we're really making some progress, but we need to really be honest with ourselves because we have a lot of trauma as coaches when it comes to working with parents. I know I have, even in the work that I'm doing, you know, I've had some, what we refer to as soccer parenting as crazy soccer parents uh, in on my teams. And it's really a challenge, but we need to make sure that we're not framing those thoughts, those feelings that trauma, I say kind of with air quotes, not to be too dramatic about it, but uh, you know, that we're framing it appropriately and making sure that we're being thoughtful. So that's my first takeaway for you all today is to really think deeply about what you tend to believe to be true about parents and be willing to open your heart and to change your beliefs. Um, and I, I really do know from the work that I'm doing, I'm positive that, uh, that change and being open-minded is absolutely required. And um, we'll get into this in more, more deeply as we get in. But we need to start with the idea that parents are receiving a ton of mixed messages regarding engagement. You know, they're being told to be engaged, they're being told to be less engaged, they're being told to care more and care less, they're being told not to go to practices, uh, they're being, uh, they're uh, like deeply afraid of being portrayed as a crazy soccer parent. Um, and we need to acknowledge the fact that parents are receiving these missed messages and realize that for us as leaders of teams and as clubs, it's us to, it's up to us to be very clear in our messaging of this is your role as a soccer parent to establish those boundaries, to actually speak of them very clearly because there's been such lack of clarity and such disengagement uh, historically over the years for parents that it's really uh, the onus is on us as leaders within the game to be very specific. And we need to acknowledge that the vast majority of parents are what I would qualify myself as. They're level-headed and they're sometimes stressed. Like, being a parent in today's society is hard. Like children have a lot of pressure on them. We have a lot of pressure on the, on us. There's a lot of social media pressure. Uh, there's so many things that kids can do to get involved in life and we get pulled in a lot of directions. But regardless, as coaches and as club leaders, we really need to take a step back and, and just maybe tally uh, the number of parents that you worked with this past season and how many of them you would actually qualify as unable to help like crazy soccer parents versus sometimes stressed, if I can give them some support and guidance and education and connect with them in just the right way, then they'll be fine. And what's happened for us historically is that we have given way too much time, attention, energy to the crazy soccer parent. And what we've done as we've done that is we've neglected the majority of parents. And so we've given too much, uh, too much energy to the crazy ones and let them rule a little bit too much. And the focus at soccer parenting is to rise the level-headed parents up and to help them control the sidelines, control the culture at your club, be the influence that is really controlling the narrative within your team, within your club uh, structures. And so, um, the work that we're doing at Soccer Parenting to give coaches and clubs a platform to engage, inspire, empower parents is really so that we can raise the energy and the influence of the level-headed parents who really, who really uh, do want what's best for their children and might be stressed sometimes, but, uh, but can be helped with some education and some guidance. So I hope that kind of frames um, that. And if you have any questions or thoughts about that, absolutely just pop them in the Q&A and we'll um, you know, get to that. But, but that's you know, kind of big picture. These are our belief statements at Soccer Parenting. And I really hope that you, um, that you reflect on them. Um, maybe even in a coach education event that you have within your club, uh, talk about them. And uh, you know, maybe spend some time and think about, reflect on them. But we really do believe 
that you soccer parents will be difference makers when it comes to improving the game, that when parents seek information about how to best support their child, that great things will happen. And we really do believe that a more collaborative environment between coach club, parent and player is in the best interest of player development. And that a strong and supportive community of level-headed and like-minded parents and coaches will really lead to this concept of inspiration for players. And um, that is a lot of what we talk about. We use the word inspiration a lot. Um, you know, we want our children to have this deep rooted connection to the game, to the sport, to this uh, world sport that can give them so much in life. And so for us, the focus is all about inspiration. Okay, so the why behind parent engagement and why this is important for you. Um, there is a lot of very well-qualified research related to effective parent engagement programs in schools. And what we know from this research is that effective parent engagement programs in schools, those schools have children that perform better, that uh, have better test scores, that they complete their homework, that children in schools that have effective parent engagement programs have stronger self-belief, they stay in school longer, their teachers are satisfied and the parents are empathetic. So that is what the research is very clear about. And imagine if we take this over to clubs and we say that effective parent engagement programs in clubs will then help kids play better, feel more inspired, train on their own, have stronger self-belief, not quit. Parents will be empathetic and their coaches will be satisfied. Like if I came to you and I said, I have a solution that will help you with this, everyone here would say, yes, sign me up for that. Well, the solution for all of that is in fact parent engagement. And we have historically unengaged parents not connected with them or not been really sure about how to do that. Or maybe you've had one or two coaches in your club that have been really great about it. Or maybe the leader has been really good about it, the technical director, but the coaches that fall under him or her are not very good at it and don't have adequate training and guidance and support as far as it's concerned. But parent engagement truly is a solution to all of these things uh, and really solve a lot. So let's talk about how, and then we'll talk about what, and then we'll move on to some other really key things. Um, so parent engagement hows. There's three C's that I think we really have to talk about here. Um, the first thing, and this is me talking maybe more directly to coaches, um, which we all are, but is that we need to be confident. Um, in order for us to be effective with our interactions with parents, we have to be confident as far as that's concerned, which leads me to number two. Um, and that is this sense of, um, oops, sorry, I just want to go back. That is a sense of develop your emotional intelligence. And so um, it's my favorite thing to do education around emotional intelligence and coaching. It's the foundation. It's like what makes a good coach. All of our great coaches that we have have been fortunate to have personally. I think of Tony, I think of uh, Dr. Macknick, all of these uh, wonderful mentors that I've had have all scaled really, really high when it comes to emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and team management. You know, this is what makes coach, what makes quality coaches. And um, really for us to be confident in interacting with parents, uh, it falls under the beginning stages of emotional intelligence, self-awareness and self-management. And so uh, self-awareness, what do you believe to be true about soccer parents? Uh, self-management, how we're actually interacting with them. So the number one step for, um, for um, parent engagement is confidence. And the, two, the second C here is collaboration. Like we need, to, uh, we need to realize that this is us working together with parents. Um, and uh, we're collaborating on making sure that players feel a deep connection and sense of inspiration. But um, so this isn't us talking to parents, it's actually trying to, to give them space and ownership and some um, sense, of, um, sense of connection to the club. So when we get at the end of talking about sense of community theory, that's the sense of collaboration. And then finally, for us to be really effective when it comes to parent engagement, we have to be consistent. 
So this isn't like you start out the season with all these grand messages and don't follow up that we'll get into with trust. Um, but it's that we have to be just whatever we say we're going to do, we have to do. But also, it doesn't have to be very robust what we do in terms of how we interact with parents, but it just needs to be consistent. Um, it needs to be really a part of our DNA as a coach and the way we're choosing to interact with the parents. Um, so what is parent engagement? Uh, I think it's helpful to dive in a little bit to what it looks like from a club perspective, what it looks like from a parent perspective. So it's pretty simple. <laughs> it's just being consistent with these things. It's, it's choosing to do them, choosing to empower somebody within your club to be responsible. So it's club-wide communications, uh, whether it be your social feed, whether that be emails that go out, whether that be your website and how you communicate through that, your team snap or whatever communication channel you have. It's these club-wide communications. That's obviously a big part of parent engagement. It's the coach communication. So if you're a club leader, what mandates or responsibilities do the clubs with it, where the coaches within your club have to have parent meetings? Do you outline what those parent meetings should be? Do you give them talking points? Do you train them and how to have those parent meetings? Um, and do you make sure that they have clarity around what you believe as a club is the role of parents and that the coaches believe that as well? From a club and coach perspective, parent engagement is also team meetings I mentioned. Uh, so coach communication might be emails or consistent communication that they have. Um, key to this for coaches is these brief interactions. You know, these are, these are so valuable to us. It's the interaction that we have with a parent while we're getting out of our car on the way to practice or we're, you know, getting ready to, to walk out to the pitch for a match. It's, hey, how's it going, Jonathan? Great to see you using their first name, actually talking to them instead of just putting our head down and thinking about the lineup, like taking advantage of that brief interaction will make a huge difference when it comes to parent engagement. And yes, that is important because we went through all the whys of why, uh, you know, the benefits of parent engagement. So that is why we need to do that. Be intentional about that. It's individual player meetings, depending on the level, depending on your club philosophy, depending on the skills of the coaches to do these, but um, you know, having some feedback to players is a big part of parent engagement that often gets missed. Um, and is you know, one of our greatest um, gifts as a coach is to be able to have transformational conversations. Obviously we have these with players about leadership and what they're seeing and, and you know, how they're feeling, but we also have the ability to have these with parents. And, um, you know, uh, the ones that are feeling some stress, really diving in, how can I help? What resource can we have? Why do you think you're feeling that way? Um, you know, giving parents and reassurance. Um, those are transformational conversations when it comes to parents and interactions that they have with their child. Um, so, you know, it's such, a, it's such a gift for us as coaches to be able to have those. And um, from a parent perspective, you know, this is what parent engagement is from a parent perspective. It's going to meetings, reading your emails, getting your child to training on time. Like that is what we're talking about from a standpoint of um, parents' perspective for parent educate for um, parent engagement. It's parents need to support the goal setting process for the players. Um, uh, notice, I don't say lead the goal setting process, but support them. Um, I'd love to see clubs around the country that we're working with having goal setting events for the players that are led by coaches that the parents then um, have some some like glimpse into. But you know, those are the transformational things that will happen that will establish the strong, strong sense of community um, and parents being able to get some guidance on how to support it without leading it without um, pushing too hard, uh, the value of giving their child autonomy and um, how that leads to motivation. All of those types of things are essential for parents to understand. Um, from a parent perspective, parent engagement is a ton of silence mode. We'll talk about that with the sideline project, but how we choose to uh, interact when we're on the sidelines is a big choice that parents uh, need to make when it comes to parent engagement. Parents need to educate themselves about key areas. Soccer parenting, we educate parents on the body, the mind, the game, the coach club relationship, the next level in parenting itself. So just think about for a second, just the body 
and all the things that we never think to talk to parents about when it comes to their child that actually would be so helpful if parents knew a little bit more about. What if parents knew about relative age effect? And then all of a sudden they can have some clarity about their November birthday child that's struggling right now at the age of 12. You know, or what if parents uh, had a little bit more information about how growth impacts performance or how speed is impacted through growth spurts? Like, so there's so many things that we've just absolutely not even thought about, haven't been on our radar screen to educate parents about when if they just had a little bit more information, then the playing environment for their child, the environment that you're coaching in would be much improved. So at soccer parenting, those are the key areas that we're thinking about the body, the mind, the game itself, uh, the next level, whatever that means for their child, the coach club relationship and parenting. Moments of ignition are key for parents. And these are things that you all as club leaders can really work to inspire the parents within your club to think more about, like uh, encouraging uh, the parents to get outside and play with their child, giving them um, a fun game that they can play and encourage them to put a video of them juggling with their child on your Twitter feed. Uh, just random suggestion I just thought of, but you know, these sense of moments of ignition that parents can have with a child, whether that's sitting down and watching a professional match with them, going to a college game together, those types of things are key for parents. Um, I already mentioned to go outside and play with your child. And obviously the parent's biggest decision they make is deciding on the playing environment that their child um, competes in. So um, you know, from a parent engagement standpoint, this is what we're considering when it comes to what is parent engagement. So my third takeaway for you all is, you know, really allow yourself to rethink the coach parent relationship so that you start to work with parents. And um, just a couple quick slides to go through on this. I think we've kind of already talked about this, but I'll go through this slowly. You know, when I ask coaches, why do you coach? When I ask coaches, why do you coach? Coaches say, well, put it into the chat. Let's interact a little bit. Why do you coach? Uh, I'll monitor the chat here, chat here for a second. And uh, Jacob, yes, uh, I assume you'll get a recording of it. Actually, I'll let. So, why do you coach? Put some put some thoughts into the chat here for those of you who are still. We're not going to move on until there's some things in the chat. <laughs> enjoyment. I love that word. Oh, David, you put that in, Peter. Um, yeah, I love the word enjoyment. Uh, I'm interviewing Nick Levitt for soccer parenting from uh, UK coaching. He was formerly with the English FA, one of my favorite soccer people. And he frames a lot of the work he does around enjoyment, not fun, but enjoyment. Love it to serve. I love teaching kids about the game, to see players develop both skill and character. Yes, fulfilling, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously these are, this is why we coach, right? And um, when I ask coaches, how do you define a successful season? I get similar answers. When kids keep coming back, when kids, wow, thank you so much for everybody. I love these comments that are coming in. Um, um, why do, how do you define a successful season? When kids sign up for another season, when um, there's this sense of joy, when uh, the players don't wanna leave training at the end of training, when, um, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's more about the process than anything. And when I ask parents, why do you register your child for soccer? I hear things about life lessons, teamwork, solidarity, being healthy, healthy living, all of those things is why parents register their child for soccer. And how do they define a successful season? My child is having fun. They get into the car with a smile on the fa their face. They wanna keep playing soccer. That's how we define a successful season. Never does anyone talk to me about wins, yet we give that so much play in our environment. Um, so let's think about this. We ask coaches why they coach and what defines a successful season. We ask parents the same thing. And we come together on this concept of inspired players. And that is where we can align. And that essentially is what parent engagement is, is parent engagement is coaches, clubs, and parents working together to ensure that players are inspired. And that can just frame exactly what we're talking about very, very simply. So all of the steps that you might do to that uh, when it comes to parent engagement, the club-wide communication, the team, the coach meetings, the brief interactions, when we think about the parents' role, these moments of inspiration, getting out and playing with their child, supporting their child's goal-setting process, 
all of this, we actually are on the same path as parents and coaches. There is not a separation. What the path is, is to children who feel inspired. And that's, uh, that is what parent engagement is. So, um, and again, I welcome your questions and thanks so much for your comment there. I loved seeing all this come in. There was this hold and then everything came in all at once. So um, I didn't get to read all of them, but we'll get back and look through them. Um, but I love seeing a lot of uh, comments there. And, um, you know, that's obviously so important to our why and why we were at this. Um, I talked earlier about trust. And I think it's important that we reflect on it just a little bit more. Um, my favorite book to read about trust, if you're curious about um, de developing more trust-filled relationships and the value of that, uh, whether that be for your club or whether that be for you as a coach, uh, my favorite book is The Speed of Trust. It's kind of an airport book. I think Stephen Covey wrote it, the junior, not the dad. Um, but it's actually like breaks down steps to developing trust very clearly. Um, a lot of the clubs that we work with have uh, read that as like a book club book for some coach, their coaches within, within the club. Um, so really, if we can develop trust-filled relationships, um, that then, then we know that our parent engagement will be working. Uh, what we know about trust-filled organizations from a ton of research is that they have increased value, accelerated growth, enhanced innovation, improved collaboration, better execution, and heightened loyalty. So uh, again, if I didn't need to give you any more reason to dive into trust and to actually maybe frame uh, the culture for your organization around trust, uh, I don't think I need to give you any better reason than um, what happens when an organization has trust in their foundation. Um, so these are some steps to establishing trust for us to be thinking about as club leaders and coaches. I, I talked about this earlier, you know, keeping our commitments. It always shocks me for a couple of reasons. When I get emails from parents that say this, and I get these regularly, the coach said at the beginning of the season, that we would receive uh, individual player evaluations in November, just to give a month. It's January and we haven't gotten them. Do you think it's okay if I ask? <laughs> so two things there, you know, the first thing I have to say is that the parent is so nervous about being perceived as a crazy parent that they don't even wanna ask for something that has been promised to them is a big problem to me and something that we need to get better on as, as organizations and as leaders, because leadership really matters here. Um, but the other thing is that we wonder why we're struggling in youth soccer and why we're not living up to our potential. And it's because of this inherent lack of trust. And when we do things like that as clubs, individuals, organizations, whether it be as clear as saying we will deliver something that we don't, or whether it be maybe not as clear as maybe in a parent meeting at the beginning of the season saying every child will play at least half of every match and then not actually doing that. Um, so we need to keep our commitments in order to establish trust. And we need to listen first. So this is where this self-awareness, self-management really comes in this emotional intelligence. You see the parent calling you, you know, their child didn't play well you know, they're struggling, you see the phone number pop up, like what are the thoughts that come to your mind? What's the stress, anxiety, stress you're feeling in your heart, in your chest, in your stomach at that moment when you see that parent number come up? Maybe it's, maybe it's frustration, maybe it's anger, whatever it is, uh, we need to pause all of that, have some self-management and just listen first and really try to understand uh, and engage with a parent in a really powerful transformational way. Um, we need to set clear boundaries. And this is my favorite takeaway of trust. And this is what is so easy for us to do. And this is where our leadership needs to come in and say that this is what the boundaries are within our club. Like this is when it's okay to talk to a coach. And this is when it's not okay. This is not really a 24 hour rule. I'm not a huge fan of them. I'm not against them, but I just don't know that we need to like structure things quite that way, kind of take it situation at a time. But if that helps, 24-hour rule, that's fine. 
but it's okay to talk to your coach if you have a question about the game. If you don't understand uh, the offside law and you're curious about that and you keep getting confused, talk to your coach about it. Absolutely, the door is open if you have a question about the game itself. What's the difference between an indirect and a direct kick? Or why is there a drop ball in that situation? Or can you explain the build out line to me? Like those are all great questions for parents to ask coaches and the door is absolutely open. We're setting boundaries around that. It's okay to talk to your coach if your child has, has repeatedly walked to you after a game or practice or gotten in the car and not been inspired. Like repeatedly, like that's a time where, yes, we should be talking to the coach. The coach should want to know if a child is struggling so that we can come up with a plan to help and make sure that we do our best to be able to solve the situation or meet their needs. Um, it's absolutely okay to talk to your child's coach if there's an issue with another player that involves real bullying, then the door is open. The door is closed though. If you want to talk to your coach about a game time decision they made that was tactical in nature, that's not foundation and just curiosity. Uh, so uh, about a substitution they made or why people started, not okay. The boundary, the door is closed for you to interact with your coach about those. The door is closed for you to talk to the coach about another player unless it has to do with bullying. But you can't ask, why did this player start? Because they, even though they missed practice twice this week, like the door is closed to you, not an okay conversation to have. And obviously the door is closed about any, um, you know, like I kind of already said, like game time, tactical decisions that you make or who starts and those types of things. So when we set really clear boundaries, while it seems to be like, whoa, I can't have that conversation with a parent, they'll get really offended. Parents love it. Because the vast majority of parents are level-headed, they're sometimes stressed, and they're living in dire fear of being portrayed as a crazy parent. So when they actually have a legitimate question or concern or thought or worry about their child, they don't feel like the door is open. And that is what's causing so many issues in youth soccer. So if we can actually just work to have very clear boundaries, so the parents can say, yes, I'm allowed, the door is open, the coach wants to have this conversation with me, and the coach actually gives that feedback to the parent as well. So setting clear boundaries is so important to us. We need to right our wrongs. Um, I'll tell you a story that I sometimes tell. I trust you guys, because this is not the greatest story, but it is true, and what I did is that, you know, we don't always love every child that we coach, or I don't. I wish I could say I did, but you know, every once in a while we get a player that just kind of rubs us the wrong way. And we work through it, we're okay, we're not, you know, treat them poorly. But I had this girl on my team a few years ago that just constantly was rubbing me the wrong way. And after training one night, we always bring it together, do a quick Richmond Strikers where I'm coaching, cheer. And uh, we do this after every practice. And so we're bringing it all in. And this girl is walking away and going over to her bag. And so I screamed her name and I said, come on, we're going to do the cheer. She looks over her shoulder at me and just keeps on walking. And so I called a little bit louder. And, uh, you know, all these girls are here. We're about to do this cheer. And then she sits down and starts going through her bag. And I lost it. I screamed at her so loud. I've never even screamed at my children like this. Uh, her name and telling her to get over here right now. And then I look down and I have like 11 little nine-year-old girls looking up at me with these bright wide eyes that I just like lost it right in front of them. And, um, and so I apologized to the girls. I walked over to the girl, apologized to her. And then I walked with her to the parents who aren't right around the training session, but walked with her. I explained to the parents, listen, I really just lost it with your daughter. I got really frustrated with her and I screamed at her at the end of training. I'm really sorry. I promise that won't happen again. And then I got home and I realized I have to address this with all the parents because you know what happened when those girls got in the car. Oh my gosh, you should have heard coach Sky. She was so mad. I've never heard, you know, so I had to send an email to everyone just saying, Hey, at the end of training, I got really frustrated. This is righting our wrongs. Like these things happen to us as coaches. Maybe we get ejected from a match, whatever it is, we need to right our wrongs because if we don't, the trust and the ability to have trust is extremely, extremely limited. Um, we need to demonstrate respect. 
my favorite way to do this. And I think just like a KPI, a key performance indicator for clubs when it comes to being effective in parent engagement is to set a standard within your club that coaches, you need to know the first name of the parents on your team so that you don't go through and see them as you're walking out to the game and just go, hey, you can say, hey, Jonathan, and that makes such a big difference. It's a wonderful demonstration of respect. It's a simple demonstration of respect, and it actually opens the door to so much more when it comes to that relationship. And we need to extend trust as well. So if we want trust to be given to us, we need to extend trust to the parent. We need to not make assumptions about them. We need to assume that they want what's best for the child. Maybe they're feeling a lot of stress, but we can come in and help. Um, hopefully, you know, sometimes we can't because they are truly the crazy ones. Any questions on that? Um, I, uh, again, I don't see any questions coming into the Q and A, so I'm just going to keep going, but I hope we'll have some questions or some conversation here at the end. Um, number five for you all is community matters. You know, if you haven't gotten the theme here, uh, parents matter leadership matters and community matters would be like my three key takeaways here. And um, uh, this is a lot of slides I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna do this very quickly um, because of our time, but also just because I'm gonna hit the highlights. But this is, this is research on sense of community theory. Um, it's well-documented research. We've been very lucky that Eric Legg from Arizona State University has done some follow-up research about how to establish sense of community within parents, and his research is focused specifically on soccer parents. So um, I'm collaborating with Eric right now on a project with New England Premiership League in New England where we're working on sideline behavior. I'll tell you a little bit about that as we wrap up here. But um, this is all based on research and sense of community theory research that we have. Um, okay, so there's four dimensions of community. Just real quick thoughts for you. We're probably gonna have lots of notes to take on this. So the first thing is group membership. So what the research says for parents, for players to feel a sense of community, there has to be this concept of group membership. Group membership actually is four different areas. The first is personal investment. So these are the four things that make up group membership. Obviously, parents are investing financially. Um, they're investing their time. They're driving their commitment, their energy. So that is built in to soccer already when it comes to community building. We talked about boundaries and trust. And very interestingly, boundaries come up again in this research. So actually having boundaries will help establish a stronger sense of community when it comes to group membership. Parents need to feel emotionally safe. They need to feel that trust is being extended to them, that when they come to you with some stress they may be feeling for your, their child, that they will be emotionally safe in doing so, that their child will not, you know, have repercussions in the next tryouts or whatever it is. Um, they need to feel that there's a sense of belonging, that they belong. So maybe it's as simple as coaches using a we pronoun instead of a you pronoun when they're talking about the team um, instead of when they're when they're having a parent meeting, like bringing parents in to this will lead to group membership. The second area of community when we're talking about sense of community theory is that parents needs are being fulfilled. We'll pause again here. Let's pop it into the chat. What do parents need? What do parents need? You all have lots of experience here. And so if we know that one dimension of community is that parents need their needs to be fulfilled, it opens the door to the question, what do parents need? They need clear communication, clear communication, communication over and over again. I'd say that's part of it, that the coaches, the clubs be accountable to what they say. Oh, yeah, Creed, I'd like that to feel the child is safe with you. They need direct feedback. They need quality information. Um, great. Thanks for all those comments. Keep them coming in. I will say that what parents need is to know that you love their child, to know that you care about their child as a human being. Um, if you can demonstrate that by the way you're talking to the parents, by the emails that you're sending out, by the values that you're pushing out as a coach or as a club, if you're a club leader, if you're really layering these into your coach education and not just putting them out on your website as 
what your values and your beliefs are as a club, but if you're actually living them and fulfilling them and the lives of these players and families and communities, parents need to know that their child is cared for. Um, another sense of, in, of community, uh, where we're thinking about establishing a sense of community. We have group membership, the four components of group membership. Parents need to know that their needs are being met, to need to know that they have influence. And that is what parent engagement does, is it gives parents some influence. It says that we value you. You're a part of this experience. We want you to be a part of this community. So just by simply reaching out to parents, engaging them more, getting them involved, there's other ways that clubs are doing this by creating like parent groups and working groups and things, but just simply having a parent engagement program in place gives parents influence in this space and a shared emotional connection. Lots of great ways that as club leaders and coaches, you could do this, whether it's bringing the parents in at the end of a game for a cheer, whether it's, um, uh, you know, making sure that parents have gear from your club that they can wear, they feel the sense of belonging and connection um, uh, through everything. So just to recap, sense of community theory, um, there's maybe, I know some of you probably want to snap a picture of the slide, but it's group membership which leads to personal investment, boundaries, emotional safety, sense of belonging, their needs are being fulfilled, they have influence and that there's a shared emotional connection. If you're working and curious about having stronger culture in your club and in your teams and establishing this sense of community, this is what the research is very clear on the steps that you need to take in order to build this sense of community within your organizations. And I know that what I love so much about the interactions I have with you all from NorCal is that these things ring true to you, that this is really what you're seeking, that this game resonates deeply for you. And um, these are the steps to trying to bring this to life within your organization. Hey, so Scott, number six, yeah. Scott, we, we did get a question. You, you mind if I ask? Sure, it? okay. go for it. Asked, As our players age, parents are less involved. What would you suggest we do to encourage engagement? Yeah, I, 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 that's a great question. And um, I, of course, experienced that with my children, my son, my youngest is 18 and just getting ready to go to college. And so suddenly they're driving themselves to training. You're not interacting with them as much. Um, I would say a couple things. The parents still often will travel. So maybe it's simply trying to come up with a, a, a moment. Well, this is what, this is the simple way to do it <laughs> is to have a team manager on your team and also have a social coordinator on your team. And so as parents get older, it can become a little bit more social and those interactions, hopefully the teams aren't shifting around so much once the kids get older, which actually invites a stronger sense of community when the parents, they get to know each other a little bit more. There's not about as much stress of the child not making the team, like the teams get a little set. And so have a social coordinator that's actually you know, out of way games or matches or tournaments or trying to find a couple of moments where the parents can connect. But I will say that if you look at um, like statistics for parent engagement in schools, obviously that parent engagement is much stronger at the um, elementary schools than it is at the middle schools and the high schools as well. And that's just sort of the normal path that parent engagement takes, but it's still reaching out and giving them information. But um, you know, those interactions might not be as intense, um, but it, it's also just being intentional when the parents are there. Walking over to the sidelines after the match instead of walking right to your car, just to give a quick little hello. Just simple things like that. It's just not, it's not rocket science. Do you think that was a good answer, David? I mean, uh, Rick, did I do okay with that one? Yeah. Worked for me. Did, did I, okay, I just wanna make sure. I mean, it, there's, not, there's not like a set science to this, but this is all just about being intentional. Um, but it, it will drop off. Absolutely. Okay, so number six, and thanks for that question. Um, number six is to protect the player's level of inspiration and enjoyment by really making sure that we're establishing some sideline norms around accepted behaviors. So this is also about boundaries in a different way than what I've discussed before, but we need to talk about sideline behavior. And uh, thankfully, um, you know, uh, NorCal is a sign project partner of ours, and our sideline project is a program that we are extremely excited about, and it's making a big um, impact. I'll demonstrate the site to you in a little bit and show you where the pledge is that you can have all your parents take. 
But what we've done at the sideline project is we've done something that has not been done before, shockingly, because we all know that sideline behavior is a huge problem, um, whether it be referee abuse or whether it be um, kids not learning up to their potential because of the way that people are interacting with them while they're trying to learn and play. Um, but what we failed to do is actually educate parents and coaches about sideline behavior. What we've done is say, don't do this or don't do that, or it's too much or be quiet, or here's a lollipop, or it's a silent Saturday. Like we, but, but what we're doing at the sideline project is actually educating parents and coaches about what the research says about sideline behavior. And what's key here is that you all as, as broad organizations that we all use the same vernacular. So at the sideline project, we're framing sideline behavior around three types of, of behaviors, supportive, distracting, and hostile. So supportive behavior is what we all assume is pretty clear. Good job, keep going. A lot of parents think they're supporting, uh, caveat, and coaches think they're supporting, but they're actually distracting. Distracting behavior is talking to somebody when they're in the middle of making a decision. And if we play the game, we know that we're always making decisions. So um, without giving really clear cues, uh, well, I know Doug Lamov has been um, an educator with you all. Like Doug has been on the sideline project and at soccer parenting a number of times talking about cueing behaviors and how we interact with players during matches so that uh, we can actually support them instead of just distract them. So uh, distracting behavior is talking to your child as we frame it for parents when they're in the middle of performing. So pass here, shoot, throw to this person. While it might look like it works because you might tell your child to throw the ball to, to um, Mercedes and they throw the ball to Mercedes and Mercedes has a breakaway and scores and you go, I'm so glad I said that. It's actually, you know, like hampering long-term cognitive growth and skill acquisition. Your child would be much better off having figured that out on their own and maybe making a mistake or, uh, you know, learning actually in the moment. So distracting does not help. And then obviously we know hostile behavior and what that is. Um, and this is abusive behavior to referees, talking to other players that happens way too often. Parents talk to other players, abusive communication, just your child itself, uh, themselves during the game. So that hostile behavior, obviously we need to put an end to it. But the sideline project frames distracting behavior as something that we need to put an end to as well. Um, and I want to um, share a different screen with you real quick as we're doing this. And I have it kind of queued up here, I think. Well, I'll share this and then pop over to it. Okay, so um, this is, you're seeing the sideline project, right? So this is the Sideline Project website. Um, again, thanks to um, NorCal for being one of our league partners here. We certainly appreciate it. And um, what you can do here to get involved is simply pass this pledge page off to your parents, your coaches, anyone that's a spectator. Uh, we would love their name to get added to this pledge wall. And this is a two and a half minute video that I won't show you here, but it's a two and a half minute video that frames uh, some education around supportive, distracting and hostile behavior for parents. Um, and it's an education video about it. And then parents, coaches simply add their first name, last name, initial, the state they're from, and then their name gets added to the pledge wall. You can see so many people from Massachusetts, New Hampshire here, because New England Premiership is really pushing this out right now. Um, Missouri just launched as a state association. There's some people from Missouri, um, but um, their, their name will get added. And I know as an organization, you all have pushed this pledge out before because there's been other times where uh, it's been flooded with people from California from, um, from you all pushing this out to your families as well. A couple other things here I want to point out to you all as club leaders um, to consider. This goes to the coaches that are working with the youngers is, um, you know, if you're working with some of the little kids, uh, this pregame huddle will really, really be uh, something to consider. It's a great tool for parent engagement. Uh, our time is kind of limited here, so I'm not going to get into all the specifics, but if you just come back to the sideline project, go to do more, go to pregame huddle. This is clear, specific instructions on exactly what you can do for a very quick 
one to three minute pregame meeting, not really them interacting with you, but just you as a coach talking to the parents just before a match happens. So there's specific topics that you can cover, a frequently asked questions area for coaches to go through. Um, it's something that is really working. The feedback that we're getting from this has been extremely positive as well. And um, also just wanted to take my last minute here to talk a little bit more about sideline behavior because I mentioned that we're doing this program with New England Premiership. Um, which is a league, like I mentioned, out in the Massachusetts, New England area. And uh, part of this uh, program that we're doing with them has been surveying referees. And so in the last week, we have about 450 responses from referees. And uh, a lot of our questions in the survey were framed around parental behavior that they've witnessed or been aware of. Have you ever been afraid of a fan? And then at the end, there's a place for the referees to post comments. And um, over half the referees actually took the time to actually write comments here. And by far over 50% of those comments say, you're missing it. The real problem is coaches and players when it comes to hostile behavior. Those are the, the, those are the problems that we're having during the game. This is what's making me want to quit. This is what is frustrating me the most is the behavior of the coaches and also of players. So, um, you know, I think it's really essential that you all as leaders really process that. And um, the only way that that behavior will change is with leadership. And so, you know, the onus is on us as leaders in a game to really make sure that we're being very clear on what's acceptable behavior and that we have good quality conversations with our coaches about the frustrations that they have. The onus is also on the referees to get better. I hear you loud and clear. And there's some really exciting programs that are starting to happen with SE, Bahamas, and Colorado. We're doing a great program here in Richmond where we have a referee coach that's on the fields that as clubs we're paying for the referee coach to be out coaching the referee, giving them instruction in the middle of the matches. Uh, referees that have had some negative reports on them, they're getting some some support. So that needs to happen as well. There's lots of solutions here, but I just want to, knowing that I have this captive audience of coaches, that you know we have to get better with uh, how we choose to interact in the middle of a match with a referee who we think is uh, not doing a good enough job. Uh, it's it's a stress. It's a struggle, and we need to start having real conversations about how this is going to get better. Um, and the sideline project kind of frames that as well. So I encourage you to um, dive into the sideline project. Uh, you know, if there's any follow-up questions that people have or any ways that I can help guide, support you all. Um, we do have a couple hundred club members across the United States, um, some from NorCal um, that are here on the call, San Ramon, I'm sure there's others that I'm so sorry, they're probably going, oh my gosh, you forgot about me, Walnut Creek, is that NorCal that is, right? Um, you know, so, uh, you know, however we can support you all as clubs, we are here to help, um, the mission at soccer parenting is to make you soccer better. And there's no way that we're going to do that without involving parents. They are key to, uh, key to the whole, to the whole puzzle here. So, um, thank you all so much for your time. I will certainly hang out for questions if there are any, but, um, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, you can catch up with me at soccer parenting and Twitter. Facebook, LinkedIn, and pretty much everything is my name or soccer parenting. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sky. And um, for those of you like me who uh, were inundated by the amount of content, um, rest <laughs> assured, uh, we've had several questions about whether or not this was recorded and it was recorded. So NorCal will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website later. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see if Great. there are any Question. Thanks, Louise. Thanks for some nice comments here. Appreciate it. But if there are any questions, um, what's the best resource you know of to educate parents on the benefit of youth sports? Um, the best resource? Well, I mean, I would say, I mean, the work that we're doing at Soccer Parenting and our Soccer Parent Resource Center kind of frames all of that. So we have an entire education platform that is for parents regarding um, how they can support their child in youth sports. So um, if you go to Soccer Parenting, you can see that and Soccer Parent Resource Center is the uh, URL for the education platform that I'm happy to, um, you know, 
give you some more information about. Um, one of the real problems and challenges that we have is that we don't like, like I'm interviewing Nick on Wednesday for, for soccer parenting and he's with UK coaching and UK coaching is a government funded organization in England that sole responsibility is to support coaches from grassroots to their Olympic pro sports um, in becoming more influential. Like that's their job and it's all government funded. We really don't have that here. Aspen Institute, we have U, the USOC is supposed to fall on those lines there, but you know, we really don't have it as a government entity. So it is a challenge. All the more reason for us to align around similar messaging so that as clubs coming at this or leagues or you know within our whole landscape in the United States, we really want to align around similar language and um, messaging so that we can really make an impact fast. Sky, can I ask a question? There was a lot of invaluable sure. content. I know, I know that um, having spoken to a number of coaches and coaching directors, there was a lot of interest in just trying to maybe um, identify some best practices that clubs are already doing um, that really would ultimately improve the behavior of parents on a sideline. And with mm -hmm. with your experience you've seen and met with and educated a lot of different clubs and i'm wondering if there are any sort of concrete examples of things that clubs are doing that are so it's more of a standardized approach mm -hmm. for all of their teams yeah. um, that, have, that have been really productive in improving sideline behavior yeah, absolutely. Well, so the sideline project that I showed you is a two and a half minute video that's free and accessible to anyone on that site, uh, the sidelineproject.com. So uh, there's also a 15 minute educational course at the sideline project that is behind a paywall. But we have we have clubs that are requiring parents take this 15 minute course. Like that's what New England Premiership is doing. Every parent in the entire league is being asked to take this 15 minute course and they're gamifying it across like so the the feedback we have from that rick when pa when parents take it this is the feedback because we ask parents two questions two months after they take it 82 percent of the parents that feel like their behavior had room for improvement 82 percent say that their relationship with their child improved as a result of taking the sideline project course that's phenomenal to us and 67% uh, of parents say that their behavior improved as a result of taking the course. And the key thing here is that the clubs are requiring it. And I know that historically, that's such a scary thing for us to consider doing, but the clubs that are taking a stand and saying that the, the game day experiences of our children, our referees, our coaches of our community matters. And uh, you know, those are the, they're starting to see some real behavior change. So start at the sideline project and start with that, uh, you know, that NorCal supporting that two and a half minute video that will make a difference too. It's, uh, you know, it frames the support of distracting and hostile behavior. And, um, and it really will uh, just, it's, it's just not the pledge that nobody reads anymore and just signs. It's, it's, an, it's a video that you watch and you're starting to engage a little bit and connect a little bit deeper. There is a question about that. They just popped in, uh, Sky. How do we confirm that our parents signed the pledge? Yeah, there's no way that you can do that on that short pledge. Um, if you, I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying not to sell this, my membership. So I'm, I'm trying to be very cognizant of that. So I'm, I, I, I hope I don't feel like you're, I'm being obtuse, but if you are a member at Soccer Parenting, and and then and I'll I'll just say that the, the memberships are very like five hundred dollars for the year for your whole club to have access to this. But then you can require them take the course, and we can send you verification of who takes it. They'll get a certificate. They'll um, have a little bit more detail there. But um, I mean, there's other ways that you can sort of gamify it, or you know that they took it. You you'll see their name on this, but you'd have to scroll through and just see first name, last initial state is all you'd see in that situation. Um, but um, you know, just pushing it out to your parents will make a difference, um, just in terms of your club culture. And do do you need to be a member to take the course? I'm sorry if I missed that. The 15 minute course, yeah. yes. But the two and a half minute video, no. And the two and a half minute video is really effective. It's a short and firm. Um, I will give everyone a little, uh, like there's a little way that you can uh, see the course and take it 
for free that's on and i'll just um see if i can show this to you guys real quick while people are still kind of lingering here okay so here is if you go do more and you go to the coach led program which is free and you just register um here then uh i don't want to have to register sorry i think i can just cl click it myself um Oh, shoot. Well, if you register, I'm not going to fill this whole registration form, but if you register here, you'll be taken to the coach portal. Well, here we go. And then at the coach portal, you'll see that there's the longer video here. So you have the chance to watch it yourself and get a sense of it. This is an older video. You can see the logos are different and all, but um, it's kind of a trick that people have. So if you want to do it for free, you just register at the coach led program and uh, can work through the season long coach facilitated program that's free and accessible to people right here. I hope that wasn't too confusing. I probably just lost a few people on that, but uh, since we're talking about it so much, I wanted to give it. <laughs> so, and, and Sky, since we are recording this, by all means, please type in, maybe you could type into the chat, the, the um, address for your website where you become a member yeah because, for um, sure. sure i mean again i just i'm always cognizant of not trying to um sell things too much so if you just go to um sorry i'm gonna make this go to everyone uh soccerparenting.com is the public site from there um you can learn about club memberships and uh i don't have my glasses on i'm <laughs> like is that right you soccer parent i hope that's right i don't know if it's right uh soccer parent resource center and yes uh for the whole soccer parent resource center our education platform um that is just uh 500 a year for all the clubs to join um the education platform is a robust um education platform for um for coaches for parents and again yes absolutely it's 500 a year for all the parents, all the coaches in your entire club to have access to this education platform um, here in the library where, um, you know, you'll see there is just a ton of content. I can just scroll and scroll and scroll through this. And this is where you'll see our courses, um, our sideline project courses right here, uh, our soccer parenting 101, 201, 301, and our successful soccer parent course. And there's a lot more information as well. So if you're interested in this, just um, you know, reach out to me. You can talk to some of the other clubs that are already members um, with us from NorCal to get some feedback from them. But um, you know, it's an education platform for parents. It's not like every parent at your club is going to be here all the time taking all this information in, but it's it's giving parents um, some some uh, agency in the experience that their child is having by offering them this ability to be educated and many parents are taking advantage of it okay well we've kept you well awesome. past the hour, Scott. Yes. So thanks yes. again for sharing your expertise your knowledge um norcal owes you more than a drink at this point and, um... <laughs> oh they gave me plenty of drinks at the convention we'll just be clear <laughs> on that but no i appreciate that i need to get out there and see you guys yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, so, be fun. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining. And again, yeah. this uh, webinar is being recorded, and we're going to make it available on the NorCal website. Thanks, guy. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.